This video lesson is going to be about Passover, or Pesach, as it's called in Hebrew. Um, Passover is one of the most unique events in history. It really is, and it it has spiritual uh, meaning to it that affects us to this very day. Passover is the spiritual portrait of God's plan of the hope of man's salvation. How could this be? How could the, the night of Passover and the things that uh, God had the Hebrews do, the, the ones that listened, how could it be uh, the spiritual portrait of man's salvation? You know, what goes on inside a person uh, as they go through, uh, if you want to call them steps, they're not really not steps, but I don't have really a word for the spiritual meaning of what takes place within a person, you know, the steps of salvation, you know, they had to overcome their own foolish pride. They had to def deflate their own ego. And that is the symbol of that was the unleavened bread, as we're going to take a look at. They had to become humble before God, which means they had to uh, seek the truth. To understand and seek and find uh, the truth. They had to come to grips with the fact that they were indeed sinners. You know, a lot of people go through life like they're eternal victims, like everything is happening to them. <laughs> like they don't have anything to do with any, anything. You know, they're, they're the eternal victim. You know, and a lot of people fall for that. You know, or to play the blame game. You know, this we're in this situation because of you. Or, you know, you made me do this, which is ridiculous. All of us have to take uh, full responsibility for our own selves. Anyway, their bondage that the Hebrews were in uh, when Passover happened was self-inflicted. As we're going to take a look at uh, how I come to that conclusion. All of spiritual bondage is self-inflicted you know there's many forms of bondage fear is the most common bondage fear will hold you captive you know it, it isolates you from people you know it, it drives you to have anxiety like you wouldn't believe do you understand it's like you're caged up and you don't know how to get out of this uh, fear is awful and it's the most common form of bondage you know, doing drugs will eventually put you in bondage. The more drugs you need, the more money you got to make. Or, you know, you have to find ways to afford to uh, keep up this bad habit that there's no end to. You know, uh, alcohol or alcoholism can hold you in bondage. So there's many forms of bondage. You know, they were, the Hebrews were in a physical bondage, but they were also in a spiritual bondage, which is even worse. Meaning they were oppressed. They were unable to freely express themselves. They were unable to uh, be free to be uh, the creative people that God intended all of us to be. To express ourselves, to be creative. They were stifled. Do you understand? They were oppressed. And that's what bondage can do to you too. But don't forget, just as the Egyptians were sinners for what they had done, the Hebrews were sinners too. Different sins, perhaps, but all are sinners. God says that all have come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Your own sins can hold you kept, uh, captive. But when they came to the place of becoming humble and saw the simple truth that they were indeed sinners, that they were responsible for their own selves, uh, they simply, like a little child, what else could you do but say you're sorry to God, to tell God that you're sorry and mean it within your heart. You know, there's a, if you're an adult, you're two people. You're the adult that deals with all the nonsense of this crazy world. You know, all the uh, manipulation, the corruption, uh, all the uh, uh, people, you know, that try to lie to you to get your money and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's the adult part of you. But 
you also are the little child within. You're, if you're a man, you're a little boy within. If you're a woman, you have a little girl within, and that's the real you. And that's who God is trying to reach. And in order to reach you, it's, it's difficult to reach somebody when you're dealing with the adult, adult part of them. Most adults, I would say, the vast majority would have a hard time believing in a loving God because they look at the world and say, how could there be a loving God? Look at the world. But the little child within believes anyway. Do you understand? They believe in their heart. Do you understand? You don't have all the, the knowledge to make a judgment about the world. You don't know all that's taking place. You may just see the world the way you want to see it. You're looking at it through your own kaleidoscope. Do you understand? Other people look at the world differently than perhaps you. So your, your uh, judgment about the world could be askew. You, it could be off. Nevertheless, the little child inside is the one God is trying to reach, and that's the real you. And certainly by becoming humble, that's how you deflate your ego of an adult, you know, and get rid of this covering, this this uh, layer of, I don't know what you would call it, of the adult, and try to get right down to the child. The Bible even makes it clear. Jesus says, come to me as the child that you are. Come to God as a child, because that's who you truly are. The little child that feels uh, lonely, the child that feels unloved, you know, that's that's a very common thing. You, you go through this life and you don't feel like anybody loves you at all. You know, you, it's hard to feel God's love or to find God's love living amongst this world. Anyway, Jesus made it clear. The kingdom of God is within you. It's not in the outside world. This world is full of deception. Uh, certainly Satan has turned it into a wilderness and it's hard to find the truth amongst the, the, the wilderness of lies and deception and manipulation. Anyway, so you ask God to forgive you, and you ask God to deliver you from your own self-inflicted bondage, and he, he will. He will keep his word if you come to him with a pure heart. He cleanses you of your sins, and you become reborn. A rebirth as a child of God, redeemed and set free, saved from the wrath of God to come. Certainly, uh, the judgment on Egypt also affected the Hebrews. They were all sinners, just different sins. Do you understand? And uh, how how could the Hebrews escape the wrath of God to come? Well, the ones that obeyed Moses and did as he told, you know, did all the things that God requested by taking the lamb's blood and putting it on the doorway of the home, they were all saved from the wrath of God to come, the tenth plague. The Hebrews that did not put the lamb's blood on their houses, all the Hebrews within that home perished the night of Passover. Anyone, the, the, the faithful ones that did all that were requested, even though they may have not understood any of it, they still did it. And that's what real faith is. Faith is not saying, well, explain to me how this works, and then I'll see if I believe in it. Faith is believing without understanding, or without fully understanding. Anyway, they were saved by the blood of the Lamb and by the grace of God. And certainly it was grace. The Hebrews, even the faithful Hebrews, did not earn their way to go to the kingdom of God, did they? They didn't do anything to earn God's favor. They were saved uh, by God's grace. And that's how we're all saved, by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the door to the kingdom of heaven. He was the door back then to the Hebrews, and that's what that door with the Lamb's blood signified. It was a symbol of the door to the kingdom of God. And faith is what opened the door. Just as it, it was back then, it is the same to this very day. There's only one way to God our Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. 
you know, it's up to you to go through that door. Anyway, Jesus is the only way to the uh, kingdom of God. Anyway, uh, there's many things that we're going to talk about here as we get started on one of the most epic nights in history. And, of course, history is two words, his story. It is God's story. And Passover certainly is one of the most epic nights in his story. The first thing we'll do is is simply look at where did the word Passover come from? It, it comes from Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 13th verse. And most of the information we're going to talk about is found in the 12th chapter of Exodus. Anyway, the 13th verse. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So that's where the word Passover comes from. Anyway, what we'll do here is start reading simply, uh, uh, start at the first verse in the 12th chapter of Exodus here. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Verse 3. Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel. We're going to stop right there because it's essential that we understand what is God saying? Speak to all the congregation of Israel. Why didn't God say, speak to all of Israel? He specifically states, speak to all the congregation of Israel. And there is a huge difference between the two. You know, all of Israel and specifically the congregation. What does it mean? The religious Hebrews of that time. Speak to the ones that believe in me still. Speak to the ones that have held tightly to the testimonies of their forefathers. Do you understand? They didn't have a holy Bible back then. They didn't have the Torah yet. They didn't have the oral Torah, the written Torah, the Tanakh. They didn't have the, uh, you know, the Hebrew Bible. They didn't have the holy Bible with the Old Testament, New Testament. What did they have? the testimonies of their forefathers and their experiences with God. And they were passed from generation to generation. So think about it. When you heard the testimonies of your forefather, Abraham, and his experiences with God and his knowledge of God and the events that took place with him, you still would have to think, is this true or not? Is this made up or what is this? If you believed in it, it took faith. Faith is everything. It's You were not an eyewitness to what, uh, to what took place with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, and of course to Joseph. But they, they believed in their heart that this was all true. And it still took faith. It still takes faith when you uh, crack open uh, the Holy Bible and start to read it. You you have to decipher, is this just a, a story made by men or whoever? How could this be? It's, it's beyond my understanding. I can't even comprehend it. Do you understand? It's You still have to have faith to believe that it's true. Faith is everything. Keep in mind, there's never going to be any scientific evidence that God exists, ever. Why? Because... When God created this uh, world, this universe, he made sure that a man could not find any evidence of his existence. Why? Because in doing so, it creates the need to have faith to believe God exists. If we had scientific proof that God exists, faith would become irrelevant. You wouldn't even, it would become null and void. Therefore, all the workings of the Holy Bible would be absolutely fall apart. Do you understand? So it still takes faith to believe that God exists. It still takes faith to believe that Jesus Christ exists. It still takes faith to believe in Jesus Christ, to have trust in him, to believe in him. And that's how you enter into the kingdom of God and on to eternal life. 
the promised land of heaven. Nevertheless, they were going to the promised land, the land of Canaan. You know, it, the depiction is, of course, the promised land of heaven. The, uh, the events of uh, Passover are the spiritual portrait from beginning to end of man's salvation, what takes place within a person. It's incredible to me. Anyway, they held tightly to the stories of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, the fall of man. You know, uh, they held tightly to their knowledge of the story of Noah, the great flood. You understand the judgments of Sodom and Gomorrah and why they were destroyed. And that, of course, they knew about the 12 sons of Israel. They knew about uh, how Abram became Abraham, uh, you know, when he was born again into the kingdom of God. And God said, walk before me and be thou perfect. That was an indication of a rebirth. And, of course, when Jacob was born again into the kingdom of God, God gave him the new name Israel. So you get the 12 tribes of Israel at the time of Passover. And, of course, uh, most historians say at the time of the Exodus, uh, there were over 2 million uh, Hebrews in Egypt. So that was quite a growth within hundreds of years. Uh, of course, Passover happened 3,500 years ago. But anyway... The congregation had faith to believe in these stories, which gave them faith. It was the foundation, uh, which what uh, they built up their knowledge and understanding of God Almighty. If you were not, there was two different Hebrews that night, secular Hebrews, religious Hebrews, all of Israel, and then the sect of uh, Hebrews that were the congregation of Israel, the believers in God. You understand, if you were a Hebrew and you were secular during that time, you would have never known about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. You would have never heard of these people, your forefathers, because you, you didn't care. Everybody is unique. Everybody will either have a thirst and hunger for the things of God, or they could care less about God. Look at Esau and Jacob, the two twin brothers, the sons of Isaac. The one uh, was called Jacob. They call him the tent dweller, which means he hung around the tent amongst the wise men and, of course, his father and learned about the things of God. And he could have cared less about the outside world. Then his twin brother was the opposite. He didn't care about anything about God. He only cared about the outside world. Do you understand? And there's the, the division between the two people today. Those who have a hunger and thirst for the things of God and those who do not. And that what happened in uh, uh, the tribe of Israel uh, on the night of Passover was a split, not only between Hebrews and the Egyptians, but within the Hebrews, a split of secular Hebrews and the faithful Hebrews that went on to go to the promised land. The Hebrews that were didn't have any faith in God, they all perished the night of Passover. And I would it would be naive to think that all the Hebrews went on to the promised land. That's ridiculous. That's a fairy tale of a story. That's a fable. The, the, the reality of it was many Hebrews perished because they did not believe in God. They didn't do any of those things that Moses requested. And they all perished at midnight. They all died by that tenth plague. Everyone in the home. Uh, and anyway, the next thing we're going to look at is the fifth chapter. Your lamp shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from a sheep or from a goats. Your lamb shall be without blemish. What does this mean? Without blemish. I think that really it speaks for itself. It had to be perfect. Do you understand? There couldn't be any, uh, it had to be all white. You know, it couldn't have any uh, dark markings uh, in its wool. It couldn't have any blemishes on it at all. And it's, the, what is it? A depiction of perfection. Uh, but not just perfection, the fact that it was all white, it was clean, all clean, perfect. No stains, a picture of innocence, blameless. 
And of course, that had, that has spiritual meaning to it. Everything that God had them do, He didn't have them do for any old reason. It had specific spiritual context to it. And it, it was out of their reach, but then it wasn't. Some of the wise men understood it. You know, they were trying to learn as they were doing it. They had to do this very quickly, by the way, just within a few days. They had to pick out a lamb on the 10th. And then on the 14th evening of the 14th uh, was Passover. So th this was done very quickly. But these wise men of the congregation of Israel were pretty sharp. And, and uh, God, uh, they had a foundation because they had a, a faith in God and the testimonies of their forefathers. But God was doing more now, different things. So now God's adding uh, more pieces to the puzzle, so to speak. So this lamb was a, a depiction of clean, perfect, no stain. And of course, it symbolizes uh, that only a person that has no spiritual blemishes within their soul could go be with God in heaven and on to the promised land of heaven. It had to be, you had to be perfect and righteous. Do you understand? And so they began to understand this, that I have to be perfect in order to go be with God in heaven in the afterlife. I would have to be a perfect person. But the fact that they had to make the sacrifice, this offering, a burnt offering, uh, this lamb was going to die in their place. It had you had to understand I am not perfect. Whatever I've done, uh, I have not. Uh, lived a perfect life, not been a perfect person. Otherwise, this lamb wouldn't have to die, and I could just go on to be with God in heaven somehow, someday. But the fact that it had to die for me to live shows me many different things. And like I said, it shows me that I'm not perfect. So it, it put up like a mirror for them to examine themselves. You know, what's real easy to blame you know, the Egyptians for all their trouble. It was easy to blame God. And don't kid yourself, I'm sure there are many Hebrews that blame God Almighty for being slaves and in bondage in Egypt. Don't kid yourself. And uh, there were many who blamed the Egyptians. But when it came down to it, the only one they could really blame was themselves. How could I say this? Well, think about how they ended up in Egypt. Think of the beginnings of Joseph and his terrible brothers that uh, were going to leave him to die in a pit. And then they sold him into slavery into Egypt. They knew that Egypt uh, turned people into slaves. They knew this before they went there. You understand? So think of their origins. They came to Egypt because of the wrath of God, the seven-year famine. To escape the wrath of God, they fled to Egypt and out of the uh, uh, land of Canaan. But I'm sure that a lot of them were seduced by the fact that, oh, oh, our brother has a powerful position here. Maybe we can get powerful positions in Egypt. Maybe we could live like kings, like Joseph. And they fell for the temptations of the outside world. Egypt was at the epic center of commerce and trade. It was the epic center of the, the civilized world. It had everything that life had to offer, all the pleasures of sin. Do you understand? The greatest foods, the greatest wines, the greatest housing, you know, all the, the greatest clothes that you could get, the most modern clothes and, and jewelry and gold and silver, all the trappings uh, that we all face. Is, it's all the same. It's just, it's uh, packaged differently these days, but it's still the same. We are all seduced by the temptations of the outside world. Who wants to serve God back in the promised land of Canaan by Hebron, in the grassy fields of Hebron? There's nothing out there. Look at Egypt. Oh my God, look at it. We're staying here. At the time, uh, when Joseph was in power, there were only around 70-some uh, Hebrews, and they all went into uh, Egypt. Jacob did not want to go, but Jacob was seduced, not by Egypt, by the mere fact that his son is alive after 20 years, his favorite son. 
his firstborn of the woman he loved, Rachel. Nevertheless, so uh, that's a great story in itself because of, of many different things. But uh, so they all ended up in Egypt. But keep in mind, after the seven-year famine was over with, they didn't go back to Hebron, did they? They did. They, they didn't go back to the land of Canaan, the land that uh, Jacob called the house of God and the gate of heaven. And do you understand? It was the promised land that the forefather Abraham, God had promised them this land uh, uh, for everlasting possession. Who wants to go serve God in the grassy fields of the land of Canaan? We're staying here. And they made a choice, see? But as time went by and they started to grow, and this and that, the, the Egyptians did as they always had done. They turned them into slaves. But they forgot about Joseph. Do you understand in the great story about how he became Zapanath Penea, savior of the world? They forgot about uh, this Hebrew that saved the world. Do you understand? And time went by and new pharaohs, uh, uh, you know, pharaohs died and new ones came into uh, power. And, they, for, and they, they forgot about the real history of Egypt. They could have cared less. They were in a powerful position, and we need more slaves. And you people look like uh, you, you would be good slaves. And they turned the Hebrews into slaves. So it was their own fault that they were in Egypt to begin with. Their own fault. They couldn't blame anybody. Their ancestors had put them there, not Egypt's, not Egyptians. So it's their own fault. And that's the truth that they had to deal with. You know, it's hard to become humble for a lot of people to see the simple truth because they have layers and layers upon them of, you know, uh, of an ego. And, you know, they can become arrogant. They could have a very skewed uh, sense of judgment and fairness and justice. You know, it can cloud your mind. Because at the end of the day, their spiritual and physical bondage was because of their own self. They had no one else to blame. They couldn't blame God. They couldn't blame the Egyptians. They had to blame themselves. And that's a hard thing for many people to do, to, to take an honest look at themselves. But there is good news. Because when you come to this place of being like a little child and facing uh, the fact that you're responsible for you, you know. God is willing and ready to forgive you. And all you have to do is ask God to forgive you. Like a little child, come to God as the little child that you really are inside. That's who God truly loves. The adult that has to deal with the nonsense of this crazy world is not who God is looking for. He's looking for the little child within. Next thing we're going to look at is the fact that this lamb is, as I've said, a sacrifice, an offering to God, a perfect offering to God. It is called a burnt offering. It's called a korban ola in Hebrew. Now, burnt offering is very, like, mysterious, but then it's kind of simple, really, because... Uh, think back about the first offering we hear about in the Bible is Abel. Abel gave God uh, gave God an offering, and uh, of course the uh, the next one I believe and it's one of my favorite is Noah. When Noah, uh, when the flood was over with and months had gone by and they finally uh, the ark finally hit land and they got off the ark, what was the first thing Noah did? The first thing Noah did was he built an altar and he gave God burnt offerings, clean animals, perfect animals. Why? Because he was thanking God with a sincere heart. He saved his, uh, his life. He saved uh, his wife and his children out of all the people of the earth. Could you, you can't even imagine that. You're the only, how could you even Use your imagination to even think of what it would be like to be Noah. It's incredible what took place. And anyway, so he's giving God thanks sincerely. God is so moved by what Noah is doing, the sincerity within his heart. 
he lifted the curse of the ground. Could you imagine that? God is moved by one man's uh, sincerity, his thankfulness. That's incredible. And what a, a lesson that is for all of us, really, is to find gratefulness to God and to be thankful. You know, and, and, and get away from constantly maybe wanting things or this or that, and, you know, and being clouded by many things and just simply being thankful to God for the little things in life and the big things too. But anyway, he moved God. That was one of my favorite stories about a burnt offering. So what is a Corbinola, a burnt offering? What is taking place? Well, how can you, how could you uh, give God anything? God is invisible, right? He's up in heaven above you and he's invisible. How do you give an invisible God anything? This is something that the wise men back then figured out. You would give God uh, uh, something by putting it on an altar and it would be consumed by this magical thing called fire. Now, fire transcends our comprehension. Nobody can really explain to me what fire is. You just can't. Sure, you could tell me the chemical composition and this and that, but it, in the aftermath of that, you still can't explain to me what fire is. This four-letter little word, and whatever this thing is, it's like magic. And fire can warm you, or if you get too close, it can certainly burn you. So it's both, you know... It's good and, you know, be careful what you do because you could lose your life by this magical thing, fire. But anyway, the wise men figured out this is how you give an invisible God something. You pick out the most perfect animal in your flock, a male, you understand, and you give it to God. You certainly would not give God a weak and sick animal because then you're thinking, well, it's going to die anyway. Why not just... To you know, kill two birds with one stone here, that would be an awful gift, wouldn't it? You really think that'd be a sincere gift? No. So you gave God your best, your male. You understand? You put it on the altar after you bled it out. You certainly wouldn't put it on there as a live animal. You, you bled it all the blood out. It was dead. You put it on the altar, and then it magically started to shrink, turn black, and disappear. I don't know what's taking place, but it's going up, right? That's where the thing called smoke, whatever this thing is, smoke. I guess all the atoms, the small particles of whatever this little lamb is, is going up uh, to God. And this is how you get God something in, in an act of gratitude and thankfulness, a perfect little creature. And so it disappears before your very eyes, and there's nothing left of it. After three or four hours, it's poof, gone. What just took place? Where did it go? How did this happen? Do you understand? It's, it's beyond description. It disappeared. So you give it to God. But the thing of it is, do you really think it stays in this vapor, smoky, formless thing? No, of course not, because then it's nothing, really. So what you would think is, okay, it goes up to heaven, and then it goes, it, it gets put back together again in the perfect creature that it was, because only a perfect creature could go to a perfect heaven. You understand? And this is what we call what? Resurrection. See, Abraham was the first known man to believe that there was a resurrection in a story of, uh, how God wanted him to give up his firstborn, Isaac, as a, a burnt offering, a corbinola. And he reckoned it within himself. Now, God, he said, well, God said that through Isaac would be the covenant, you know, that there would be many descendants. But now if I give him up as a burnt offering, how is this going to all work? Because he's going to be dead. Oh, so when he's resurrected up in heaven, God can make him come back to earth and still be the head of the kingdom of God on earth after I die. He's the first known man to know that God could uh, do a resurrection. He could bring somebody back from the dead, and you understand. 
So he's uh, uh, the stories. I'm not going to explain it all, but the, it, it's all there in the scriptures. And he had faith in God that God not only could do it, but He would do it. And of course, we know the rest of the story. Isaac had a front row seat about what a Corban is. He was a little kid, around 12 years of age, when this happened, and uh, <laughs> he got a front row seat. What a great lesson! I'm sure he never forgot. Nevertheless, so this is what a corbanola, a burnt offering is. This is what this lamb was going to be, this perfect little creature. We're going to give it to God. It'll be resurrected in heaven. But this was a unique burnt offering. Why? Because as we're going to read on here, God wants them to eat this offering as much as they could. And then the rest of it that they couldn't has to be consumed by morning. All of it gone. So what does this mean? So the wise men of the congregation of Israel had a vague understanding about what burnt offerings were, but this is something different. This is something new, which perked their attention, I'm sure, as they're trying to fulfill all this at the same time, trying to understand it. This was, like I said, happening very quickly. Anyway, before we get there, we're going to read on to the uh, the sixth verse here. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Why did God want them uh, to keep it from the 10th to the 14th in their homes? For many different reasons. Uh, the most obvious is to get to know the land. I'm sure the lamb was very frightened. I'm sure it was very scared. I'm sure it was uh, very nervous and shaking. It's a very meek creature. I'm sure it bleated for its mother. In other words, it cried for its mother numerous times. Keep in mind that dynamics of these houses was something very unique, given the fact that the Pharaoh had been putting to death all male Hebrews for over 80 years. You understand they were all being thrown into the Nile to their deaths. So in these homes, it was all females and older men. So I'm sure in this dynamic that many of the females started to cuddle this poor little scared uh, creature. You understand they cuddled with it. They loved on it. Some of them, I'm sure, kept their distance knowing it's fate. I don't want to be emotionally involved because it's going to... This creature is going to die for us. Most females have a very unique bond, not only with animals, but with babies, of course. They have one of the most unique, special bonds that you can't even explain this. And part of it is they all have a little Eve within them. And, of course, Eve is uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, Eve is named Eve because she's the mother of all living things. And, and most females have that connection between, you know, like Eve did, between herself and all living things. And certainly they have that bond, and they certainly have a strong bond to be motherly, you know, to a little baby. It's innate. It's within you. It's nothing to be taught. It's already there. Uh, do you understand? So I'm sure they loved on this land, and it was in their home for those four days. And it began to trust them and stop shaking, you understand. Keep in mind, a lamb is a very innocent-looking creature, for sure, but it is not a strikingly beautiful animal, like a tiger or a lion or a horse. For good reason, God picked this animal, for many different reasons, and of course, Jesus Christ, we know, did not have any uh, outward, outward beauty that people would be attracted to him. Everything that they attracted uh, themselves to him was because of everything that was on inside him. You understand? The beauty that was in him. So there's the great lesson about what's more important. The outward appearance of yourself, your body, perfect skin and hair color and all these silly things that people do, it's, it's, it's all vanity, of course. And the thing of it is, it's everything on the inside is the only thing that really matters. You are a spirit, an invisible spirit, a soul, 
a heart, a mind. Those invisible things are within this body. But if I was to dissect you, if you were alive, I'd never find any of them. But yet they exist in you. Do you understand? These are the things that will go on. This body will die someday and go back to being in the earth. You know, back to being dust. And so there's a great lesson in the fact that this God picked a lamb because it was didn't have outward beauty. All its beauty was on the inside of that lamb. How it was meek and it didn't have any aggression and how it was loving and it was playful. And I'm sure it jumped up after a few days and started playing. Everybody in that home had their own relationship with that specific lamb within that home after four days. But they all knew its fate. They all had to reckon with the fact that this lamb, this innocent little creature, was going to die so they could live, was going to die so they could be free. Do you understand? What a thing that had to be. I've been such a sinner that this other creature is going to have to die for me. That's something we all have to deal with as believers in Jesus Christ. It's something we all have to face. Anyway, nothing has changed in 3,500 years ago. The things that were taking place in the Exodus and specifically Passover, uh, where God was sowing seeds within man so that these seeds in time would grow up and help man uh, have a deeper, richer understanding of God's work of man's salvation, the reconciliation, uh, you know, from the fall of man to being reconciled with a loving father. You understand? There was a lot of loss that happened during uh, the Garden of Eden and the fall of man. And this is the way, the way is Jesus Christ for the reconciliation of us to our father, our, our true father. For those who believe. The next thing we're going to do is jump ahead a little bit and go back to that 13th verse. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So obviously if you didn't have the land's blood... You did die by that tenth plague, everyone in the home. And I'm not naive to think that they, nobody died. I, I, I would suspect a large number perished at night. If two million went on to go to the promised land, or, you know, to go that way across the Red Sea, I would assume maybe, a, maybe a half a million died that night, maybe more. And it's incredible, but, uh, Anyway, uh, they perished. Anyway, what, is, what does it mean that the blood shall be for them a token? What does it mean, token? Token is a physical representation, a, spirit, uh, a symbol of a prepaid voucher, so to speak. And it was something, a token. You know, these days, there's places that you can go to and pay cash uh, and, uh, uh, to somebody to get tokens to play games or uh, to go into places and this and that. You know, cash doesn't work. You had to get these prepaid tokens. So what am I trying to say? The blood of the lamb is the prepaid token for what? For the admission into the kingdom of God. Do, do you see how it lines up with Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is that token. He paid it all. You didn't have to uh, do anything more to understand. He paid the whole price, all of it. You can't earn your way to heaven. Some people are under the illusion that they have to be good or do good or do this or do that or keep commandments and do this and that. We are saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, period. Not by keeping commandments. That's law. That's something that the, the Jewish people had to do for a period of time up until when Jesus was crucified. Many of them still try to keep them. It's difficult for them to keep them, and they do mitzvahs. 
you know, to fulfill the 613 uh, ordinances of God. They do mitzvahs. They're living under law. Jesus Christ paid it all. He fulfilled law, and we're back to the grace of God. So nevertheless, Jesus Christ is that token for your mission. All you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus paid it all. Believe in Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Do you understand? And he will present to you, uh, uh, to our Father, blameless and innocent like that lamb. Nevertheless, the next thing we're, we're going to get back to is verse 7. Uh, and they shall take of the blood of the lamb and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Uh, we'll read on in verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, uh, roast with fire un and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, mean soften it up with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the Puritans thereof. Puritans means the internal organ. So this is something very unusual too. Not only are they going to eat this lamb, which generally you eat the outside meat, now they're going to eat the inside parts too. What does this all mean? They're eating the outside, eating the inside. What is this? What, what spiritual meaning does all of this have? Anyway, and it's to be roast with fire, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. And verse 10, and you shall let nothing of it remain until morning, and that which remain of it until morning you shall burn with the fire. And thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now there's a lot in those uh, five verses uh, we'll start with roast with fire. This was a trial by fire. What did I mean by that? They had a very short amount of time to make up their minds, to make their choices. A trial by fire. They were under enormous pressure, the Hebrews. Look at, if you can, all of Egypt laid in basically ruins. And all this uh, craziness in Egypt. But none of it's touching the Hebrews except this tenth plague. So this is building up to this uh, zenith moment. The tenth plague is the worst of all the plagues, of course, and it does affect not only the Egyptians but the Hebrews too. So it is a trial by fire. I'm sure a lot of them had extreme anxiety. They were under extreme pressure, and that affects the body like you wouldn't believe. Anyway, the one we'll look at next is unleavened bread. They would, I touched base on this earlier. They had to deflate their ego. They couldn't say that, God, this is the Egyptians' fault. Do you understand? Or the heck with God. Look what he's done to us. And don't kid yourself. Many of them, I'm sure, did. Many people, they're the same kind of people as today. Many people blame everything that goes wrong on God. Anyway, uh, bitter herbs. Now, bitter herbs really has to do with later on when they would celebrate Passover every year. Bitter herbs was to eat the bitter herbs as a stark reminder of, okay, God delivered us from all this and we're set free and we have a new birth and, and all these great things are happening. But don't forget, you can fall right back into bondage again if you make foolish choices if you're not careful and eating of the better better herbs every year was a a strong reminder of that fact every year they commemorate passover passover is at the new beginning of the new year according to the hebrew calendar for good reason it's like uh, they have to make new year's sort of resolutions they have to examine themselves every year to see if during a year has their ego become inflated again? Have they become arrogant to people? Have they become, uh, you know, narcissistic towards people? So it was, a, it was like taking an examination of yourself if you're Jewish 
and exam take an honest look at yourself to see if I've become an awful person during this last year. And once again, a deflation of ego. And it was at the beginning of every new year. What a great festive thing this is, though. But it takes an honest look at yourself and a, and a very stark reminder of uh, the fact that you could go back into bondage. You could get, uh, be in bondage if you started doing drugs or alcoholism or bitterness and, or, or you became unforgiving towards people. Do you understand there's many different things uh, that could lead you into captivity again after God's delivered you? Anyway, your shoes on your feet, you shall eat in the haste, speaks for itself. You're to do this in a hurry. Do you understand? Make up your choice. What God is saying is now is the day of your salvation. We're not going to put this off for a month or two for everybody to uh, try to understand what's taking place. It's taking place whether you understand it or not. And that's what true faith is. The fact of it is you do not know when you're going to die. So today is the day of your salvation. Do not put it off and think, well, I'll deal with this later. This is the first thing you should deal with, not the last because uh, we all must face the wrath of God. It, it, we're all going to face a very uh, pure uh, uh, judgment of our life. And believe me, you don't want that to happen. You don't. So how do you escape the wrath of God to come? Simply by going through the same door that the Hebrews went through that night, the faithful ones. That is, uh, believe in Jesus Christ. He is that door. You know, that's a spiritual thing. Walk through that door and enter into the kingdom of God and exit this crazy world that is under a great influence of Satan. He has turned this world into a wilderness where right is wrong and, and uh, you know, wrong is right. It's almost upside down, this world, you understand, and it's getting worse. Because he knows his time is short, obviously. Anyway, as we come to the conclusion of Passover, I've saved the best for last. But before we get there, uh, one thing that I missed that I wanted to expound on more, and that's the fact that they had a uh, rapid change of diet, which had a visceral effect on their bodies. It would have a visceral effect on anybody. They were used to eating fish and vegetables. It was forbidden for them to eat lamb because why? Because the Egyptians uh, worshipped the lamb. They worshipped Ares, which is part of the zodiac, the ram, and it stood for fertility. Had they slaughtered these lambs on the outside of their houses, it would have been a disaster. Uh, the Egyptians would have been up in arms and probably, uh, you know, uh, caused the death of many Hebrews for doing that. That's one of the reasons they had to keep the lamb in the home, too, for four days. They, because it would have been, you know, un, this would have been against their religious beliefs to slaughter a lamb, a male lamb particularly, because the ram stood for fertility, which stood for uh, the ability for the Egyptian uh, females to get pregnant. So the Egyptians would have, and the Pharaoh would have seen it as an act of retaliation for the Pharaohs having uh, put to death uh, male Hebrew baby boys for over 80 some years. They would have saw it as some sort of effort to stop the Egyptians from uh, uh, growing. So you know, the Hebrews could grow back again and overtake them, perhaps. So they had a lot of worry and anxiety on top of all this. But, uh, uh, you know, they had to worry, to worry about whether your friends were going to do what Moses commanded, what God uh, requested. Do you understand? Were they going to obey? Were they not going to obey? Were they going to go get a lamb? Were they not? You know, long-term friends and relatives and once you were in that house you had no idea if anybody you knew was fulfilling all these requests you had no way of knowing really when that door shut it was god only knows what's going to happen but uh, let me tell you something 
the fact that they fulfilled these requests showed their deep faith for God. It had to. It was an act of faith. It was all an act of faith. Believing in Abraham and the testimonies of Abraham was faith. Believing in their forefathers and the, the experiences they had with God Almighty had to be believed by faith. This was all done by faith. All of it. That's what opened that door uh, into the kingdom of God. Anyway, so uh, use your imagination and think of the chaos, the anxiety, the worry, and now it's rapid change of diet. It had a visceral effect on their bodies. They were cleansed. The cleansing of their body, uh, you know, physically, and it was a symbol. Everything was done on purpose. God orchestrated everything from the big things to the small details. God certainly knew that this was uh, going to happen, and it was on purpose to teach him that you had to be cleansed before the Lamb of God could come in you, before you could go on to the promised land of heaven. Do you understand? It's part of the process of man's salvation. There's only one that can cleanse you from all your sins, and that is the real, true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So keep this in mind, okay? So they're cleansed, and the only thing in them now is that lamb that they've eaten. It's inside of them, right? They've eaten not only the outside, but the inside. So what does this all mean? Why are we partaking of eating of this burnt offering? Remember, burnt offerings were a perfect creature with no blemish. Only a perfect creature could be given to God as a gift of gratitude. Do you understand? It was put on an altar. It disappeared because of this magical thing we call fire. And it shrunk and disappeared before your very eyes. Where did it go? The only thing you saw was this vapor-like thing going towards heaven. And this, you know, all the atoms of that animal have to be in that smoke, what we call smoke, right? So it goes up to heaven. It's resurrected up in heaven, a perfect creature, okay? But now they're eating it, like I said. So now it's inside of them. Well, how is this little lamb, this perfect lamb with no blemish, how is it going to be resurrected if part of it is in you uh, the night of Passover? How is that going to, what does this mean? Well, this is how God is showing them that the true Lamb of God has to be within you to be able to go to heaven. And what brings you up to heaven? The Lamb inside you. Do you see the beautiful picture here? The, the, the Lamb of God is the only one that can bring you to heaven. Jesus Christ has to be within you for you to go to heaven. Okay, only Jesus cannot be resurrected without you because you're part of him. Do you, do you understand? Once you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you are now part of Christ. The Bible says you become a new creature in Christ. When Jesus uh, is resurrected, you become uh, in, in Christ up in heaven because why because you ate the inside of the lamb so when you're when you go up to the promised land of heaven and the true lamb of god is resurrected you are in christ and christ is within you that is the depiction and the beauty of passover do you understand so the whole story of Passover from being in bondage to uh, being set free and being a, a new person with a new life, reborn as a holy person, that's what took place the night of Passover for all who had the faith to fulfill God's request. And don't think for a moment they had to. It was a choice they made based on faith. Faith is the only thing that can save you. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's what opens the door 